The League of Nations, created after World War I to provide an international forum to resolve disputes and to deter future wars. It famously did none of those things. Perhaps more famous though is the fact that the United States, despite its leadership being the most outspoken proponents for the League, didn't join. Which raises the pretty obvious question. Why not? Why did the United States refuse to join the League of Nations? So, like most peculiarities in American history, this one can be traced back to Congress. During the First World War, President Wilson had presented his 14-point plan for the post-war world. This included principles like the right to self-determination, armament reduction, and of course, the creation of a League of Nations to arbitrate any future issues to make sure that conflict on that scale never happened again. And Wilson was extremely proud of these ideas, and he was confident that the Democratic-controlled Congress would pass this and they just lost the midterms. And so, by the time the Versailles peace negotiations were ongoing, Wilson had to deal with a hostile Congress, which wasn't going to pass anything without any serious modifications. Thus, led by Senator Henry Lodge, the Republicans asked for some modifications to the Charter of the League of Nations before they'd agree to join. The primary issue was that members of the League were required to use military force against aggressive military states if the League demanded it, which Lodge and his peers saw as an infringement on American autonomy. Me. Wilson believed that everything that had been negotiated during the Versailles Conference was fine as it was and so refused to change anything. In fact, joining the League was bundled in with peace with Germany, meaning that America couldn't formally be at peace unless Congress agreed to both at once. Wilson tried to get around this deadlock not by changing his mind, that would be silly, but by travelling around the country and drumming up support. The idea was that the League would resonate with Americans who would in turn pester their representatives until they agreed with Wilson. This didn't work and Wilson never got anywhere with passing the treaty. Wilson was succeeded as president by Warren G. Harding, who at first wanted to join the League, providing it couldn't force America into war. But as time went on, support for the League dwindled, and so Harding signed a separate peace treaty with Germany and pushed for independent agreements to make the world safer. The most notable of these agreements was the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited the size of the Great Powers' navies. In August 1923, Harding left his position as US President to focus on his new passion of being dead, and his Vice President Calvin Coolidge took over. Coolidge was a fierce proponent of kicking the League of Nations can down the road, and he largely tried to keep America distant from European affairs. And after this, the issue had very little importance to the American people, and even less so when Great Depression. The League proved itself to be powerless in the face of Japanese, Italian and German aggression, which meant that American leadership had no interest in joining such a weak organisation. And by the time World War II had rolled around, Americans had forgotten all about it. Although after the war, America would go on to join the League's successor, the United Nations. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching with a special thanks to my patrons James Bizanet, Kelly Moneymaker, Mr Wolf, Sky Chappelle, Jerry Lambdin, Jordan Longley, Adam Stalter, Rob D. Martin, Gareth Turner, Wyan Hockey, Captain Sidog, Winston Kaywood, Spencer Lightfoot, Boogily Woogily, Aaron the White, Gustav Swan, Marvin Cassow, Robert Wetzel, Corsho Wolf, Matthew Shipley, Marcus Arsner, Alex Schwinn, Maggie Pakskowski, The McWhopper, Anthony Beckett, Copper Tone, Spinning Three Plates, Moe, Charles I, Ben Ivinson, and Scottish Trekkie.